good to get started. Awesome. So I want to start by thanking the Pi Ohio organizers for putting on this fantastic conference. And thank you for everybody coming here to hear me rant about if statements. <laughs> We're going to have some fun. So my name is Ali Simji. You can follow me on Twitter at Caius Simjus. I'm also one of the organizers of the Chicago Python Users Group. If you're ever in Chicago on a Thursday, look us up. We usually have something going on. And just a PSA, when you get back home from Pi Ohio, go get involved in your local user group. Go to meetups. Give a talk. Mentor somebody. It's a great way to have that conference feeling year-round. So when I'm not doing things for Chippy, I write back in code for Numerator. I'll work to one of the sponsors of this conference, and they sponsor a lot of things in Chicago, so they're very involved in the community. Uh, we are hiring, so if anybody has any questions, come find me after. we will love to chat about this. And sorry for the noisy puzzles that we put in the swag bag. You're the one that's Not personally, but I will take uh, I will take one for the team. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's also my Canadian to me. I apologize a little too All right, so let's get started. If statements are a code smell, it's a little bit of an incendiary talk title, but I want to start off by saying I'm not here to attack anybody. I'm not here to attack anybody's code. I just want to share a pattern that helped me write code that's more readable and a little bit more testable. So what's an if statement? If statements are elements of a programming language that allow us to control what statements are executed. So if we're given a condition, if it's true, we're going to execute a block of code and then continue. If that condition is false, we're going to skip over that block of code and continue like nothing ever happened. So let's make this a bit more concrete. Here's some Python. Our code here is checking to see if the variable today is equal to the user's birthday. If it is, we're going to print a happy birthday message. If not, we're going to skip over that and continue like nothing ever happened. So we can use if statements. And with if statements, we have the ability to tell a computer to do whatever we want when a certain condition is true. And by chaining together a series of if statements, we can solve any problem we can think of. And this is a really powerful concept. And there's a reason that if statements are one of the building blocks in most programming languages. But if we have too many if statements, it results in code that is hard to follow and even harder to modify. So what does it mean to have code that's hard to follow? We can have spaghetti logic. Here we're going to be scrolling up and down, tabbing between different modules, trying to follow the logic to understand what's going on. Code that's hard to follow is also uh, long functions that do many different types of things. It's also related functions that are not logically grouped together. And also, if we do a bad job in translating the solution into the problem phase, our code is going to be hard to follow. So this could be something like poor variable names or poor function names. And it's also thinking about solving problems in a linear fashion versus coming up with an abstraction that makes things easier to understand going forward. So what does it mean to have code that's difficult to modify? Code that's difficult to modify means that when you're making a change, you're going to touch many different parts of the code base. Also, when you're making changes, you might have to uh, modify code you've already written to get that to fit into what you're trying to do. Code that's difficult to modify also has duplicate logic sprinkled throughout the code base. When we're making a change, do we know that we change every single part we're supposed to? And also, if we have no tests, code is really difficult to modify. How do we know what we did actually works as expected? How do we know that the change we made didn't break existing functionality? We have no idea. So when you have code that's hard to understand and code that's difficult to modify, we call that a code smell. So this is a term that refers to a programming pattern that might indicate that something is a problem. And I want to reiterate that. Code smells it might indicate that something is a problem. It doesn't mean that there's a problem there for sure. If something's difficult to understand, is there a way we can simplify that logic? If changes are taking too long to make, can we modify our design so we can move faster going forward? So let's take a deeper look at the compound if statement, the first code smell we're going to talk about. So if we have one check in your code, it's pretty easy to follow. But if we have a compound if statement, things become a little bit harder to parse. And the more complexity we have in our conditionals, the harder our program is to understand. So one suggestion I'd like to make is Refactor your conditionals into a Boolean variable or a Boolean function. So going back to that if statement that has two conditionals, let's refactor that and move those, conditionals expression, uh, move those conditional expressions 
into a variable with a descriptive name. And then we can use that variable with a descriptive name inside our if block. With that even more complex conditional that has the same value over and over again, we can refactor that into a function, and that makes our code a little bit more readable. Another type of pattern that makes our code hard to read is nested if statements. Chicago has a bike share program. Uh, it's got an API. Uh, I use this API to hit a dashboard in my apartment to let me know when I should leave before the bikes run out. So let's just walk through this code. <laughs> so we're going to hit the API endpoint with requests, get a response back. If that response has a 200, we're going to go into the if block. We're going to parse out the JSON that we need, and that's going to be all of our station data. We're going to loop through each of our stations until we find the ID we care about. And for that station ID, we're going to check to see if the number of bytes is below our threshold. The limit for me is three. Then we're going to return a message. If it's more than three, we're going to return a different kind of message. So we can simplify the code from the previous slide using something we call a guard clause. So here what we're going to do is we're going to check the inverse and exit as early as possible. And what we want to do is we want to leave the main logic unnested inside of our function. A series of nested if statements makes your code look like an arrow. Guard clauses aren't the only way to flatten arrow code. We don't really have too much time to dig into specifics, but I did provide a link that you can check out uh, later on. So let's talk about our final type of code smell, the duplicate if code smell. And this is when you have if statements that are the same sprinkled throughout your code base. While the first two types of code smells we talked about they're really easy to identify, really easy to fix. <coughs> this type of code smell, it's easy to identify, but you have to have a little bit more knowledge in order to refactor. So we've all seen code like this. We have the same checks littered throughout our code base. I mean, this isn't really a problem if we never have to touch this code again, but if we have to go in and make modifications, it might make sense to investigate a different type of pattern to save us time in the long run. But what pattern should we use? We need to have a deeper understanding of the problem before we can come up with a solution. So let's explore duplicate if statements with a case study. In the Chicago Python Slack, we have a community engagement Slack bot called Busy Beaver. And one of the ways Busy Beaver engages our community is it shares public GitHub activity for registered users in a Slack channel at 2 o'clock every day. So how do we generate that daily summary? To recall, we can uh, chain together a series of if statements to accomplish almost any kind of task we can think about. So what's the algorithm to generate a summary for a single user? We'll start by getting the API, uh, data from the API. Then from all of those events, we'll collect the events that we actually care about by the type. For each type, we're going to calculate some event statistics. And then finally, for each type, we're going to generate some summary text. For our MVP, we're only going to track two types of events. We only want to generate a summary for all the commits a user makes, as well as all the repositories that user stars. So let's write up these steps in our code. So we're going to grab data from our API, we're going to extract events of interest, and we'll generate a summary from those events. So here's the, the code that hits the GitHub API, returns the payload. <laughs> then we'll pass that payload into the next function to extract events that we care about. Notice here that when we find an event based on type, we're appending to a list. And after that's done, what we're going to do is we're going to return a dictionary that has a key of the event type and a list of all the events of that type. And then finally, when we generate a summary, we're going to generate it for each type of event based on the dictionary we pass in from the previous function. Uh, so if it's a certain type of event, we're going to generate a certain type of summary uh, output. <coughs> so this is perfect. We created our MVP. We can release it to our customer and actually start learning how to make this something that everybody wants to use. Fortunately, for in Chicago, for Busy Beaver, our, our concept proved to work, and our user wanted us to track additional events. So now let's look at how we can add additional functionality to the code we've already written. So the, uh, the <coughs> event we're going to add is going to be checking new pull requests that are created. So going back to that perform function, we're only going to have to modify two functions uh, inside of that. Taking a look at the extract events of interest function, we're going to add another conditional block to our series of if statements. This time, we're checking to see if the event is the pull request event, as well as the payload contains the action that it's open. We only care about new pull requests. For generating summary from events, 
we're going to make sure that we're only looking at the pull request event, and we're going to generate the text that our user expects to see. This is pretty straightforward. Python. Python makes things easy. <laughs> or was it? Sure, we can look at this and make sense out of it, but right now we have three events. We want to add additional events. So you can start to see how this becomes a little bit more unreadable. The generate summary function is already really hard to read. Yes, I know this is on a slide. We have two spaces versus four spaces, but it's already a little out of hand. I'm not too sure exactly what's going on. Also, what about our tests? Taking a look at the diffs between our test for MVP versus the test for MVP with the new feature, we have code at the bottom that uh, checks that we generate the right summary text for new pull requests. But we also have to go back and change tests we've already written to ensure they don't trigger this new functionality. And this is because the function that we're testing is doing many different types of things. That is, we're producing summaries for many different types of events. So every time we add new functionality, we're increasing the size of our test scope, and the function has a larger <laughs> surface that we have to test. So if you find yourself making changes in multiple locations to add a new feature, or you're modifying tests that you've already written, you might have some code smells in your repository. So this was me last December. We released Slackbot. We had to add <laughs> new features. But I didn't really understand how to fit these new features into the program design I already had. Fortunately, around that time, I started reading uh, Clean Code by Uncle Bob. He's affectionately known as Robert, uh, as, sorry, he's <laughs> uh, Robert, affectionately known as Uncle Bob in the programming community. And this book has a lot of advice on how you can write better code following a series of prescribed best practices. And one of the tips this book had was to refactor if statements using mm. polymorphic classes. Mm. Yeah, I wasn't really too sure either. <laughs> so let's take a step back and talk about object-oriented programming in Python. So object-oriented programming is a paradigm that is based around objects. We try to model real-world things as objects. And when we design a solution, it involves a collection of collaborating objects that talk to each other by sending messages by calling each other's functions. Objects have data along with behavior. And object-oriented programming enables us to think at a higher level of, of, of abstraction. We can create objects with set data and set behaviors and then we can perform actions on those objects to solve the problem versus telling the, uh, telling the computer to solve things in a sequential linear manner. Object-oriented programming has four main principles. There's encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. So encapsulation bundles data and behavior into a single logical unit that we call an object. Encapsulation reduces our code complexity. It also increases code readability. Abstraction allows us to hide the complexity of our internal implementations inside of our objects. It's also recommended that when objects talk to each other, they do so by calling each other's public functions. Abstraction helps us hide complexity, and it also helps us isolate changes. So if we ever want to change internal implementations, we don't have to change the calling code. It already knows what to do. Often objects, have, uh, often objects are very similar, but they're not entirely the same. So with inheritance, what we can do is we can extract common data and common behavior into a base object. And from this base object, we're going to create <coughs> children objects that can reuse all the data and behavior of the parents. It can override base methods to enable distinct <coughs> functionality. We can also implement our own data and behavior inside of our child objects, and that's not in any way related to our inheritance. <coughs> With inheritance, we can enable, uh, inheritance enables us to uh, remove redundant code. Finally, with polymorphism, we're able to present the same interface for many different types of objects. So imagine we have a collection of children objects. We can use the parent object's interface to call each child object's implementation. So with polymorphism, we can convert conditional blocks into distinct objects. When we're doing programming using the procedural paradigm, we're using conditionals to selectively execute certain blocks of code. In the object-oriented paradigm, we're embedding this conditional logic into our program structure, into our objects themselves. So when we run object-oriented code, the type of object defines what code should be run. So this is a diagram I pulled from Martin Fowler's book called Refactoring. It sort of shows how we can turn conditional logic into uh, object hierarchy. So let's take a look 
look at polymorphism with a more concrete example. So say we have a parent class called animal. The animal object implements an interface through a method called speak. When we call speak on any of our children objects, it's going to produce a, a different behavior depending on the type of object. So if we do duck.speak, it's going to produce a quack. A cat.speak will be a meow. Dog.speak will be a woof. I guess that's just for North American dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is what it looks like in Python. We use these classes to create objects. So here we have a base class called animal. We initialize it with a name. We also define its interface with speak, and we just raise a not implemented error, so we know that we're just defining an interface. Next, we'll create a cat class. It's going to inherit uh, from, it's going to have animal as a base class, and we're going to override the speak function and return the meow, which is a distinct functionality for cat objects. And we'll do the same thing with dog, overwrite speak, and return woof. And this is that same relationship in an object hierarchy or a class hierarchy diagram. So if you, we've used the word object and class quite a bit. A class is a template that allows us to create objects. And we can also say that we created an instance of an object from a class. I really like this cookie cutter analogy. The cookie cutter is like a class, and each cookie is an instance, like an object. So going back to that case study, how can we replace conditional with polymorphism? So when we first hacked together a solution back in November, it was over a weekend hackathon. And it was really about getting a product out the door into the hands of our customers so we can start that learning process. But now that we understand what we're trying to do and the problem we're trying to solve, we can actually solve, uh, we can focus on the things that actually matter and find a better way to solve this problem. So let's talk about like, what is the bot trying to do? Once we have a list of events from a user, we want to collect events by event type, and then we want to generate summary text for each event type. Sounds like an event type would be a good base class. So let's walk through the actual steps we're going to go to uh, refactor this particular <coughs> logic. First, we want to identify duplicate conditional blocks. Then we'll want to identify what each of those duplicate blocks is doing functionality-wise. So on the top, we're matching events. On the bottom, we're generating a summary. Next, we'll want to create a base class to model our problem. So as we mentioned, we're going to have an events list class that has some data, has some behavior. So we're keeping track of a list of events. And the behavior that we've implemented allows us to add things to that list. It allows us to match events to that type. And it also allows us to generate summary text from that event list. Next, we'll start by extracting functionality from our conditional blocks into our child classes. So here we're going to create a commit class that matches our push items, our push event items. And then we're also going to generate the summary text that we expected, uh, that a user expects to see. Next, we'll extract functionality from our conditional blocks into a child classes for repositories that users start. And then finally, we'll extract functionality from our conditional blocks into a child class for newly opened PRs. We're also going to add a class to run the process of creating a summary. This class takes in a GitHub username, gets all the events, and it classifies them by type. The highlighted area is where we're going to initialize all the types of interest that we care about. And finally, we'll need to update that perform function to ensure that the right method is called with our new higher order abstraction. So let's try to modify our code by uh, tracking new issues inside of our GitHub summary feature. So we'll have to start off by creating a new class. We'll create an issues open class, this time when the event type is issues event. And if the payload is opened, we'll return true, otherwise we'll return false. And then we have some code to generate summary text pretty similar to what we had before. And then we'll have to update our driver class to ensure that we're tracking this new uh, open issues class. Again, this seems pretty straightforward. Python makes things easy. But was it straightforward this time? Let's take a look. So looking at the diff for our tests, and the diff, uh, so looking at the, uh, the test for our object-oriented solution, along with the test for our object-oriented solution with the new feature, you can see that we're only adding code at the bottom so we're only testing that new functionality. In comparison to the previous design, we're having to check code that we already wrote. So yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So I think this is probably a little bit better design. But that's not to say that there are not caveats. Like everything in pro programming, there are trade-offs. So how often is our code changed? If the code is written once and never modified again, should we really spend time refactoring this logic? 
if the code is constantly changing or we're actually reading the code over and over again, it might be worth taking some time to refactor to save us headaches later on. We come from the Zen of Python that flat is better than nested. When we're using inheritance, we don't want to have class structures that are too many levels of hierarchy deep. This results in design that's complicated and very, very rigid. Instead of having to understand several layers of nested if blocks, we're going to have to understand several layers of nested hierarchy. So we're just trading one set of problems for another set of problems. So they always say that when you're writing object-oriented code, you should prefer composition to inheritance. So with inheritance, we say an object is a type of another object. With composition, we say that an object has these types of behaviors. Personally, I think inheritance is fine, as long as you don't go too many levels deep. So when should we start refactoring our code? I really like following the rule of three. This also came from Martin Fowler's refactoring book. If the first time you do something, it should be painful. You're trying to solve the problem. The second time you do something, you feel pain, just wince, keep doing it, copy and paste your code. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> the third time you do something, maybe, and you find it uh, challenging, maybe it's time to look at refactoring to save yourself headache going forward. In a lot of cases, getting things done by duplicating code by copying and pasting is preferable than using the wrong abstraction. There's a whole talk about this by Sandy Meth at RubyConf. Really recommend you all check it out. And I also want to give a shout out to our test lead. We're able to uh, refactor our code and ensure it works as expected. So to recap, we can solve any problem with if statements, but if we have too many if statements, it can result in code that is hard to follow or code that is difficult to modify. We have talked about a five-step process which we can use to refactor duplicate if flops into polymorphic classes. But remember, we're not going to spend the time to refactor if the payoff's not actually worth it. So this is a list of resources I, can't, I found coming up with this talk. And that's it for me. Some acknowledgments, especially shout out to Chippy. Uh, so thank you for your time. I will take some questions. Yes, sir? Were there any if, if statements left over in the new polymorphic design? Yeah, so the question was, were there any new if statements left over in the polymorphic design? Yes, there was, there was a single if statement left over, just because we need a way to uh, classify things. All this code's available on GitHub, so if you want to check it out, uh, it's all going to be, uh, there's a link right there. Awesome. Yes? So within your organization and on the teams that you touch, um, what do you do culturally to sort of like really encourage this? Like, here, this is like you know a good space to talk about this. But within your org, how does how is some of this stuff received? Sure. So code review is the point. So the question was, how can we get, um, like, how can we enable people to use these kind of paradigms inside of our organizations? So code review is a really good place to start. Uh, we actually had this problem come up at work like a couple weeks ago. Uh, we did something for the second time, and we were copying pasting like eight or nine different duplicate if statements, and it's like. I made a comment in the code review like, I know it's only two, maybe we should look at refactoring. And that's something that we were sort of talking about as a team. So it's really just about talking about these things in code review and having more of an open mindset and trying to get your team to sort of see that saving time by refactoring can make your life a lot easier. Anybody else? Yes? Is there any significant loss in efficiency by abstracting? So uh, the question was about uh, any loss in uh, efficiency to abstracting to object-oriented programming. There's a little bit of overhead in making a class, so yes, there is. But I think code is read a lot more than it's written. And that's the reason I love Python, and that's sort of like the idea I had when using these kind of paradigms. <coughs> well, thank you, everybody, for your time.